Um, just a few things before we start. Um, there'll be time for a Q&A at the end if anyone wants to, you know, have a, you know, have a go or whatever. I'm sure Jacob will, you know, kindly, kindly advise you answering any questions you have. Um, but obviously, we respect freedom of speech, and the university respects freedom of speech. It's essential that we challenge ideas and, you know, we come to make new ones and cast old ones aside. So this is a really important thing. And James is going to talk for about 25 minutes or so, and then there'll be a Q&A at the end. So whoever wants to ask anything, obviously, we'll try and do our best to answer that. So um, thank you very much, and give it over to Jacob. Subscribe to, 
is an outward-looking international Britain taking its rightful place on the world stage and not feeling that it had to be protected and rescued from the blasts of competition from the emerging nations in the shelter of the European Union. That vision of Brexit saw the European Union as a failed organisation that sought behind protectionist walls to keep its own privileges going or gently decaying, rather than being willing to engage with the new competitive forces arising in the world. Again, the UKIP vision was essentially an EU just for the United Kingdom, whereas the EU has this view of itself as being the center of a civilization, but a civilization that needs protecting from the competition from the rest of the world. But I want to be more open than that. And what do I mean by that? What areas ought you to be looking at and thinking about in terms of openness? Well, first of all, let's look at immigration. Because immigration was one of the issues of the campaign, whether you like it or not. I think it was a subset of the take back control issue. I think people wanted to take back control so that they could then have greater control of the immigration figures. But nonetheless, it was a part of the campaign. What would I be looking for as somebody who favours an open and outward looking Brexit? Well, I would favour a system that does not discriminate between European countries and non European. A system that is fair to everybody, but one that wants to encourage talent and skills to come here and not unskilled labour. And let me explain why. I think our future as a nation is being globally competitive. And to be globally competitive, we need to encourage the best and the brightest to come to this country. We need the best scientists, we need the best software engineers, we need the best financiers to work in the city of London. And they will come from all over the world. They may come from India. They may come from the United States of America. They may come from continental Europe. And they should be welcomed here because of the enormous contribution they will make to our being able to compete in the world at large and to ensuring that we are the best at what we seek to do. This is obviously true at university level, but you need to have the cleverest people in the globe not just in the United Kingdom. And one of the reasons we have so many top quality universities is because of our openness. But that never needed to be on the narrow European scale. It didn't need to discriminate against a professor from India and favor one from Romania. That was a completely pointless objective. We want to be genuinely open to people of talent. But why do I add the rider that I want to reduce the players of unskilled labor? Well, the reason for that is that those of us who are in the position you are in, the people who are going to be in leadership positions in the decades to come, must think of those who are not in that fortunate position, must think of the poorest in society, those very often failed by the education system, who have not got the opportunities that you have got. And people in that situation have seen no real increase in their wages for the last 10 years. The unskilled British labourer has not had the opportunity because they've been outcompeted by sometimes very skilled people from outside this country. Now, I have great admire, admiration for the individuals who come here as individuals. They have travelled halfway across the continent, they've come to a country where they don't speak the language, they have worked very hard to better themselves and their families. That's wonderful. We should admire them and thank them for that. It's a great thing that they have done. It's a conservative thing, actually, that they have done. It's about their own aspirations and their own standard of living. But we should also think about the people who have been left behind as they have come. There are 8 million people economically inactive, 2 million of whom say they would like to be economically active. Very often, as I say, they're the ones who didn't go to university, probably didn't get a great education at their secondary school. And they have found it very hard to improve their standard of living. And their wages have been kept down because of the immigration flows that we have had. It doesn't make any difference at the highly skilled level. This doesn't hold down wages at the highly skilled level because they're set effectively internationally. And the 
value added that those people bring means that they can afford to be paid very well by the companies that they work for. But at the unskilled level, that's not true. And the evidence is that large-scale immigration holds down unskilled wages. So how are we going to help the poorest in our society if we don't limit that level of immigration? So I think there should be a two-fold immigration policy based on a principle of fairness to everybody, whatever country they're coming from, but then differentiating as to whether they are part of a highly competitive global system where we should provide the visas that are needed, or whether they will compete with the poorest in our society, in which case we need to protect people in this country whose standard of living has stagnated now for quite a long period. So that is one of the first points that I would make in terms of what the UK should look like, a policy prescription as we leave the European Union. But there are other things, other areas that we should look at. What should we be doing economically? What changes should we make economically once we've left the European Union? Where are we held back? Where will we carry on doing things that are happening anyway? Well, where we are held back, in my view, is in tariffs. But the tariffs we impose as the common external tariff subsidize, in, subsidize inefficient European industries to the disadvantages of industries in other countries and to the harm of our own consumers. And if you look at this, you see that the biggest area of tariffs is on food, where it averages 26%, plus non-tariff barriers. On clothing and footwear, it's about 11.5%, plus VAT. When you take food, clothing and footwear, that makes up 21% of the average household's budget. But again, it's much higher for the poorest in our society. And they bear the brunt of the common external tariff on the goods that they buy on their daily standard of living, primarily <coughs> to subsidise businesses that don't actually exist in the United Kingdom. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about shoe manufacturing, which is very limited now in the UK. I'm talking about orange growers, the olive growers, wine growers, Parmesan cheese manufacturers, all of those things that we don't do, but which are subject to high tariffs. Clothing manufacturers, there's very little textile industry in this country anymore. And the economic opportunity is just to sweep away those tariffs to raise the standard of living in everybody, of everybody in this country, but particularly the poorest. But again, do you see my theme? I'm opening us up to the world. I'm saying that our interest is in the narrow European sphere. We want to trade with Vietnam and with China, with Brazil and with Argentina. We want to welcome the trade coming from those countries because it will benefit our consumers, but also it will help those developing economies which will be able to sell into our markets more easily. So in trade, we should be open. And here's the challenge. One way free trade makes you prosperous if you can't get two-way free trade. That it is better to open your own market and bring in the goods from abroad even if they don't open up to you. Why is that? The reason for that is that you are consumers, and that the interest of consumers is getting the best quality, best value goods available anywhere in the world, and any obstruction to that is simply a cost and makes the economy less efficient, but also encourages us to carry on in businesses which we are less good at, where we do not have a competitive advantage. We open our markets, we allocate our capital more efficiently, to the things we're actually going to be best at. And if we bring in the cleverest people from the world who want to come here, we will find there are wide areas which we are best at and where we have a huge competitive advantage and we make all our consumers better off. So it should be an extremely open trade policy. And yes, of course, if we can get trade deals, that's even better. But it should be one-way free trade if that is all that is available. And the knock-on economic consequences are very favorable. Because if you lift tariffs, you find that the cost for manufacturers is reduced because the goods that they are importing are cheaper. 
the cost of living is cheaper, and that means there's excess money around either to be invested in new capital opportunities or to go into more consumption, again helping domestic businesses. So open up immigration fairly to people of talent and open up the market to everybody who can uh, compete here. So those are two big areas. What do you do about the City of London? The City of London, one of our biggest foreign exchange earners. I've been working in the City of London in one form or another since I left university uh, in the early 1990s, in 1991. Spent two years in London, then three years in Hong Kong, and then back in London. We need to make sure that the City of London is regulated to maintain its place as the most important international financial centre in the world. I, I stress the word international because the US economy is so big that the domestic economy is a major part of what goes on in New York. But as an international centre, London is absolutely the leading place. But some of the regulations coming from the European Union have been very damaging the competitiveness of the City of London, thinking particularly of Solvency II affecting insurance companies and of MIFID II that's just come in to affect people in my own business. A lot of these regulations are not there to protect people, they are there simply as a matter of more bureaucracy or to give the state more control because of European concerns about free movement of capital and how that works out. But our experience is much more favourable than the French experience, and we don't need that type of control. So you look at the regulations on dark pools, which have made people very nervous on the continent, and we're simply losing dark pool business to Singapore and the United States. That doesn't actually help anybody. It doesn't make the markets more transparent. It simply means we lose the business. And so we have to ensure that we remain globally competitive by having the right level of regulation, not having regulation that makes us less competitive and forces a business offshore. We've then got to think about our place in the world. What should the UK do in international relations? And this is a really important question, particularly this week, when we think that somebody has been uh, tempted to be murdered in Salisbury by Russian agents. We don't know for fact but we think that. So we know that we live in an uncertain world. What are we going to do about that? What is our post-Brexit position? Because previously, yes, we've done many things with the European Union, and we will not be tied into that, but equally we won't be prevented from discussing things with our European friends. And that, perhaps, is the key to our international relations we should remember we are leaving the European Union, we are not leaving Europe. And we have a lot of commonality of interest in foreign policy with some European countries. We have a duty to help protect other European countries, but the transatlantic relationship is also going to be tremendously important to the positioning that we take in a post-Brexit world. We have, as you all know, a permanent seat on the um, Security Council in the United Nations, and that gives us a particular authority. We have one of the largest defense budgets of any country in the world, although it's gone down from where it was as a percentage of GDP, we are still one of the major defense players in the world. And we will want to cooperate with our friends in Europe, with the Americans, um, with our other allies, to ensure that there is a response to actions like those taken by the Russians. But we also need to recognize that Western foreign policy hasn't worked very well in the last few years. So if you look at what's gone on in Syria, that has been a failure of Western diplomatic power, Western soft power, and indeed Western hard power. We didn't get the decisions right. And I don't think this is either for or against Brexit. I think it is simply that we have been making errors, and we need to be making better choices. And we will do that by understanding, perhaps, how much hostility there is to us and where the dangers come from. And the primary danger seems at the moment to be coming from Russia, and our dealings with Russia are going to be very delicate and difficult. 
but we are going to have to make firmer responses to a country that thinks it can kill people willy-nilly in cities in the United Kingdom. That is a real challenge to our security and something that we must be focused on regardless of Brexit, but Brexit doesn't mean we shouldn't work with our European allies, but it does mean that we won't be tied in to their common foreign policy, which will allow us much greater flexibility to act quickly. And if you take things like um, this trade war with uh, the United States as that develops, outside the European Union it would be much easier for us to cut a deal with the United States rather than to be bound up in European retaliation, which is almost certain uh, to be a mistake. So the vision, my broad vision for leaving the European Union, is to have an outward and open looking, to set an immigration policy that is welcoming and encouraging to those who we need to come here, who will help our economic growth in that outward looking way, to have a trade and city policy that welcomes the business that we do but puts the interests of our consumers first, because that's where prosperity comes from. And to look at international policy decision making in a way that cooperates, but doesn't tie us in to some of the mistakes of the past. I'm going to open it up to questions now. I find that at these events there tend to be many more questions than I can answer. So the longer I make available for them, the better. Now, having said that, I shall probably find that not a single hand goes up and I met with a wall of silence. But if there are any questions, do please start firing them away. Thank you.
try and keep the UK in the single market and the customs union. Basically to deny us the benefits of um, Brexit, and we should simply say no to that. It would be entirely unreasonable for us to stay in the single market or the customs union. So I was wondering, as a Conservative, uh, but more importantly as a Member of Parliament, uh, I'm sure you wholeheartedly herald the legitimacy of representative democracy. Yet after seeing your insistence that the MPs must follow the referendum result, result regardless of where they voted in the referendum, one would be forgiven your, for doubting your faith in the parliamentary system. Keeping this in mind, what is the proper role that referenda should play in modern democratic society? Um, that's a very good question. When you started by saying, as a Conservative, I thought you were outing yourself as a Tory. In this <laughs> Tory but then I discovered you meant me. But yes, I am. I'm a Conservative. Um, it's a really important and interesting constitutional question. Uh, I would add that I have publicly defended those Tory MPs who have opposed the government. Uh, on Brexit, because some of them have believed in the European project all their political lives and made it quite clear to their electorates that that was their position. And I think that's an honourable position to take. I don't think that um, members of Parliament are automatons to be told what to do by the whips. But what is the role of referendums? Um, you all know the British Constitution. Um, the key thing about it is that our constitution has not developed because clever people sat down and wrote out the perfect constitution. It's happened because of things that are responses to an immediate crisis that have then become the key documents of our constitution. So Magna Carta is a classic example. We look back to Magna Carta and think, goodness, that is the key founding document in our constitution. It's not at all. It's a straightforward political row which the king settles with the barons by giving them a deal, an awful lot of which is about weirs and fishing in the Thames, which they're all getting very upset about. Paragraph after paragraph on things like that. But it has within it things like no free man should be taken or dispossessed of his goods, etc., etc., without trial by his peers. It says that the church in England shall be free. It's got those key aspects of it, but it is a response to an immediate political crisis, not a well thought through uh, political uh, strategy. The, um, uh, the Bill of Rights, 1688, again, is a response to an immediate political crisis, that there isn't a king and Parliament is trying to negotiate with a new king before offering him the crown, has a convention that sets out these rights. The Great Reform Bill is brought forward because there are riots, and they're worried about how they respond to these riots. The 1911 Parliament Act, settling the position of the House of Lords, I, I, mean, I can go on and on, but you get the point. We haven't sat down and written our constitution, it has evolved. And that's what makes referendums so interesting, because it seems to me we are living through the evolution of referendums. And give it 50 years, when you are thinking of retiring, I think we will have a clearly defined view of referendums and people will point back to 2016 and 1975 and say these were crucial stages on developing our constitutional understanding of referendums. And what do I think it ought to be at this early stage? I think referendums are there to deal with constitutional issues where de facto Parliament seeks to bind its successors. That the sovereignty of Parliament is not the sovereignty of Parliament from nothing. It is the sovereignty of the people delegated to Parliament for a five-year period. And within that five-year period, Parliament can do anything and then report back to the electors to see if they're happy with what has been done or not. But the one thing Parliament shouldn't do is seek to bind its successors either by giving away its power or by fundamentally changing its own system of election so that its um, representation is fundamentally changed before the next election. So where would I have rep referendums? Absolutely on devolution. <coughs> devolution is theoretically reversible by an act of Parliament, but in reality it isn't. That is a permanent transfer of power to the Scottish Parliament, the Welsh Parliament, uh, and to the Northern Irish Assembly. I would have it 
on whether you reformed or abolished or whatever you did to the House of Lords. That should have a referendum because that is fundamental to how you are governed and is unlikely to be changed. And I would have it on something like the membership of the European Union where Parliament was giving it away its power in perpetuity. It is not my power as a member of Parliament, it is your power that you have delegated to me. And if I do something fundamental to that power, I ought to get your approval. And that is my doctrine of uh, referendums, and I think we will see this argued about and evolve uh, over the coming decades. So we'll see whether my definition of it is the one we end up with or not. Um, hello, Jacob. Thank you very much for coming. Um, so you've spoken before about life beginning at, uh, at conception. So I accept the religious argument. However, I think we don't talk enough about the moral or philosophical argument when it comes to abortion. So our law in the UK creates an artificial cutoff at 24 weeks, but the left can never justify why life begins at exactly at this point. So can we ever be justified in having a cutoff? Or at least, when will there be a discussion about bringing down the 24-week limit, given that over 90% of babies born prematurely survive now before 24 weeks? Thank you. Uh, um, it is a really important question. And at the heart of the issue is when does life begin? And to my mind, it's very clear, life begins at the point of conception. There is no other date you can set with any degree of certainty or any feeling of satisfaction. What would be the other obvious date would be the time of natural birth. But the time of natural birth can be a very varied point, and it is possible, and it sometimes happens, um, that there can be a car accident and the baby can live even when the mother has been killed in the car accident. So there's, it's very hard to find any other logical point for the start of life than the point of conception. If that is so, a new human being has been created, and you are then not so much arguing about the fundamentals, you are arguing a different argument about societal convenience and whether that outranks the new life that has been created. And that's where I think it becomes incredibly difficult. I have absolutely no desire to make the life of somebody carrying a child more difficult. And I see that there are circumstances where that can be an incredibly difficult um, circumstance, in particularly the very difficult case uh, of the child conceived uh, of a rape victim. But once you've accepted that life is created, there must be an obligation to that life, even if you don't take an absolute view as I do. There must be some level of obligation, and you've got to decide how high that obligation should be. And one of the things that saddens me most about our current abortion laws is that a disabled baby, baby with Down syndrome, for example, or with something as simple as a hair lip, can be aborted up to the moment of birth. And I think that's tragic because I think that is society saying they value the disabled less than the able-bodied. And I'd be astonished if there is anybody in this room who would in fact take that view if I were to ask you that simple question. And therefore I think there will be a discussion about the deadlines and how they are formed. And your point that um, babies now 24 weeks uh, do routinely survive. And then you're taking a really difficult decision to say that this baby that's born, we will make every effort to keep this baby alive, and this baby born at 24 weeks will be effectively killed. And that's a very long way away from the argument that it's merely a cluster of cells. I think it's an argument society needs to think about, um, but there is no indication that Parliament has any intention of changing the law. Good evening, Jacob. Thank you very much for coming on tonight. Um, my question is, how is class still relevant to today's United Kingdom? Well, personally, I don't think it is. I think it's a great distraction from the United Kingdom. Um, I, I think my whole view of politics, and this is a different speech, so I won't give you the whole speech, is that we are a society of individuals. But 
there is a fundamental equality of value between each individual, regardless of backgrounds or any other circumstance that relates to them, their income, their race, whatever it is, there is a fundamental equality of us all. I say, and it's true in my case, this is informed by my religious view, that we are all creatures of God and we are all equally valued. So you put that into secular political terms, there is that fundamental and crucial equality before the law. Be he ever so mighty, none is above the law. And that, I think, is a great principle in our country. So I think class is basically irrelevant, but it excites lots of um, newspaper columns because it gives them something to write about. But I don't think it determines success in our society. I'm glad to say what I think determines success in our society uh, is determination to succeed. And that's, if that's one message for you today, all of you can do brilliantly if you really want to succeed. And your background will not hold you back in your employment, in your chosen ambition, if it's politics, whatever it is. If you really want to do it, just go for it. And don't allow the naysayers to say you can't do this because of X, Y, or Z. You just want to put that view in the bin quite honestly. And I don't, I don't think class is of any great importance. And I think that's a thoroughly good thing. Good evening. Um, in this talk and previously, you've made your position as a Eurosceptic clear. Um, however, what would you say is the biggest drawback to leaving the European Union? Well, I've been asked that question before, and I find it incredibly difficult to answer. I, I, I think that's, you know, I mean, in cricketing terms, I've, I've gone out to the crease and the first one, the fourth ball to Baldwin has knocked out my middle stump because I have hardly any answer to give. Um, what is the disadvantage of leaving? I find the European Union a failing body, as I've said. I think that the free movement of people is unfair. I don't believe it's a, a free market. I think the worst thing about leaving is perhaps that we have not managed to get the tone of leaving right. And by that I mean it is really important to emphasise that we are leaving the European Union, not Europe. That because we're leaving the European Union does not mean we are hostile to the French or to the Germans or the Italians or the Maltese or the Spanish. I'm not going to list all 27. I'd probably leave out one or two and then you think I'd be anti that particular country. Um, but I think that is the biggest problem of our leaving, it is the mood music surrounding it. And I don't know if there are any people here who are European nationals, but I should like to be as clear as I can be. It is not because we don't like your country, it isn't because of any hostility. We just think the European Union is fundamentally undemocratic and we want to govern ourselves. That is why we are leaving. We will still enjoy all the cultural exchanges, the travel, the purchasing of goods that has gone on before, but we value our democracy too highly. Uh, good evening, and thank you very much for your insightful talk. Uh, I was very interested to hear you speak about the United Kingdom's place in the world, and particularly regarding your mentions to the failure of the West in Syria. My question is about your stance on UK foreign aid. Uh, so, for example, the UK this year spent uh, over £200 million pounds, uh, in Syria for humanitarian and development response to conflict. And earlier this year, you took a petition on behalf of the Daily Express and its readers to Downing Street uh, to challenge the 0.7% target for UK foreign aid. So I suppose, my, and, and I think I believe you've previously called UK foreign aid fundamentally wasteful. So my question is, as one of the wealthiest nations, and as one who, as you mentioned in your talk, wants to establish and maintain a place in the world and on the global sphere, does the UK not have a responsibility to help other nations who are in dire need? Thank oh, you. Yes, I completely agree with that. Um, I would divide foreign aid into two categories. There is one type of foreign aid that I think is absolutely right and completely justified, and that is particularly the aid we've been giving to countries around Syria to alleviate the refugee problem, where we have been the second biggest donor after the United States. That scale of help and aid can only be done by governments, and it's quite right that we should do that. What 
I don't agree with is the 0.7% target. I don't agree with the target partly because I think it's economically illiterate, that you set a target on a figure that you don't know. So you set 0.7% at the beginning of the year, but the figure you're basing it on you don't know until the end of the year, by which time you're meant to have spent the money. So come December, if the ONS has produced a rapid growth figure for the third quarter, you're desperately spending money to try and meet the target because the economy is bigger than you thought, or the other way around, you're cancelling products pro projects because there's less money than you thought. This is a really wasteful approach to government spending. You should set a budget at the beginning of the year on the facts known then and stick to it so you have the ability to think projects through properly. But then it has been wasteful. We have not used it to help British businesses when they're competing for contracts. Indeed, we're almost hostile to that notion. We haven't used it except bits through CDC, the Commonwealth Development Corporation, to invest. And I'm in favour of investment. I'm not in favour of the things where money has been wasted, like Ethiopian spice girls. What on earth are we doing doing things like that? But a major program with Bill Gates and with Rotary International to help wipe out polio in India was a thoroughly good thing to do. I'm actually not one of these people who thinks it's crazy to give money to India. India is becoming much more prosperous, but there are an enormous number of people in dire poverty living in India. There's no harm in helping India, but I think we would do better by investing rather than by random projects. So, how would I divide it up? The emergency aid I mentioned, and then investment. And that's my professional line, that I have invested in emerging markets since 1993. And actually our private sector direct investment is much larger than the public sector. Annualized about 800 to a trillion dollars a year going from the private sector into emerging and frontier markets. And I think the government should look at using the CDC more and seeking a long-term return. Because I think you spend money better if you seek a return for it rather than if you just give it away. So if one bit should be investment and the other bit should be emergencies, and then you set the budget each year that you think you can afford and that you think is rational, and you don't set some random target that was devised on the back of a fag pack in about 1975, not 1.7% target, is not serious economics. Uh, Gabriel, uh, you've quite famously come under fire in regards to your religious beliefs. Do you think the teachings of any religion should be allowed to have an impact on government policy, or do you think that should be kept completely separate? Um, well, we are all the creatures of our, our beliefs. But do I wish to impose a theocracy, an Iranian-style theocracy in Westminster? No, certainly not. Um, but I think we've got a very good balance in this country. I think we are a tolerant country. So that whatever your religious beliefs are, that is acceptable in the United Kingdom. There is freedom of religion, and it's a genuine freedom of religion. But to be genuine, you have to be able to state your beliefs. You can't be denied the opportunity to state your beliefs, and you have to be able to be involved in public life if you have religious beliefs. Otherwise, you're only a pretend tolerant society. On the other hand, I do not think that I should bring up the Pope every time I go and vote in a division in the House of Commons. I think that would be an unreasonable way to approach being a member of Parliament. But what we have is a system where most votes, the overwhelming majority of votes, relate to party political issues set out in a manifesto or derived from them. And we have a handful of moral votes, of free vote issues, every parliament. What are they at the moment? Well, since I've been in parliament, the most important one was on euthanasia. And that actually was defeated not just on religious grounds, but as much as anything on practical grounds. But I don't think you should exclude people from public life because they've got religious beliefs. Okay, thank you very much. So now we're going to move on to questions from the floor. Um, Jacob, if you'd like to select people as they raise their hand. We will then, um, Tom and I will move up and we will try and pass the microphone to you. Well, I'm um, going to be really difficult to choose the gentleman in the middle. If you get a microphone here, we'll be very well. And then, as you ask the question, Tom, if you want to pass the microphone, please make sure you stand up so we can see the camera. 
because the country needs more engineers, and we're going to compete in the next 100 years. We need lots more engineers. So you are making a great contribution to this nation, nation's future. Um, on student loans, um, this is where I make myself unpopular, because I do think that fair. Uh, I see that there are difficulties if you're doing longer courses, but as you rightly said, you'll earn more as an engineer. Uh, there is demand, there's a shortage for engineers. Why do I think it's fair? Well, the starting point is that there is limited taxpayers' money. Government can't pay for everything. And so you have to decide who should pay. Should it be paid for by the people who will go on to earn more money? Or should it be paid for by the general taxpayer, many of whom will be on very low incomes? And I think it's fair that those who benefit pay. I also think it's better in terms of your university experience, because you are now consumers, and if you don't get the quality of education that you want, you have an ability to stand up and say, this is not good enough. When I was at university, I was lucky to be getting it. I had no standing to say, well, I never get any tutorials, and I was very lucky, I had very good tutorials, very good tutors. But the power was all with the institution, none with the consumer. Your generation now is in the process of reversing because you're paying for it. And that's important because I think that helps drive up standards. But I also think um, that it is set at a level that means that people who don't go into the world to make a lot of money, whose ambition isn't to earn, um, don't have to pay back. So that it's 9% or will be 9% above £25,000 a year. So if you're earning £26,000 a year, you will only pay £90 back. It is a graduated, it is a modest contribution for lower earners. And it has encouraged the poorest in society to go to university in much larger numbers. There's a 70% increase in the numbers going from the poorest decile into university. Why? Because before there were fees, there was a cap on the numbers who could go. And that cap disproportionately affected the poorest in society because they were the ones most likely to have had the least benefit from education earlier in their lives. So it's opened up opportunity more widely. It takes the burden off the poorest in society to pay the taxes to pay for something that will benefit you. And therefore, yes, I think it's fair and proportionate. Um, Though I accept that, as with any scheme, there are tweaks you could make that could improve it. Um, yes, please. Okay. With the um, recent anti-terror attacks, uh, people's called London against Simon and Card, and also the protests against the assault at the University speech, um, I was just wondering why do you think uh, that is going on so far against during the siege? And is there anything we can do to kind of uh, change the minds of people on the left to uh, kind of really try and pull down um, people talking, especially conservative views? Well, I think one should be careful to differentiate because I think there are plenty on the left who are open to rational discussion and debate. And I imagine there are some people here uh, from the left who are in that category, or I don't see if you are. Signed up to Monomania or whatever it's called. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the gentleman who asked me a question earlier, that, that, that is the t shirt fashion statement of the year. I, 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 <laughs> next time I come, I hope you'll be wearing them. Um, but, but that's it. There are lots of people on the left who are interested in debate. There is a hard core that doesn't like debate, that seems to shut people down or Worse, I think, is no platforming. I think no platforming is really dangerous uh, because you then can't work out what views are awful. And some views are terrible, wrong, mistaken. But you only get to know that if you hear them. If you know platform somebody, if you shout somebody down, you make that person appear to be the underdog. And actually, if you engage in debate, you can destroy the argument. Do any of you remember, you probably, well you may do, the head of the BNP, Nick Griffin, went on question time. And there was a huge row as to whether the head of the BNP should go on question time. He was torn to shreds. It was wonderful. His arguments <laughs> were 
dreadful, and actually from then on the BNP support collapsed. Baroness Barzi, the Conservatives, absolutely took him to pieces. You see, I think when you engage and you debate, you win the argument. So dare I say, but I think one of the reasons the left didn't like debating is because they always lose the argument. <laughs> This has to be the last question, by the way, so no pressure. The person in yellow, please. Why are you a bit deaf? Thanks, Jacob. You outlined both the UK and the Conservative vision of Brexit as in competition with each other. Which vision do you think the British electorate voted for, and where's your evidence? I think in the end, the British people voted to take back control. I think that was the mainstay of all the campaigning. And that what they wanted was to have their democratic systems deciding how they were governed, and the ability to throw out a government that they didn't like, and an ability to ensure that the laws were our laws, not laws imposed on us from abroad, and that then you present your vision to the country at large, and you say, if I win a general election, I'd do this or I'd do that. And the election matters again. Because our government can now, or will once we've left, be able to change things which are unalterable within the European Union. So it was all about taking back control, which both UKIP and the Conservatives agreed on. And now, at future general elections, Jeremy Corbyn will be able to set out his vision of a socialist paradise. And I will be able to set out Mrs. May's vision of a free market um, economy, well run, prosperous, successful, and outward looking. And people will vote accordingly and they'll decide which one they like. That's what it was all about. Brexit was fundamentally about democracy. Does your vote matter? Everything else was a subset of that, of what you did once you got the control. Thank you very much.